today we are going to look at uh, very important programming language abstraction namely function or procedure. Uh, this is very important in the sense that you can build a uh, program in a hierarchical manner in a top down or bottom up fashion and uh, without this constructing large program would be impossible. The set of instructions <coughs> we have uh, already learnt is summarized here. This includes arithmetic instructions uh, and logical instructions which you see in the first two rows. When both the operands are registers or one is register one is in a one is in the form of a constant uh, comparison and branch unconditional jump load store load upper immediate and uh, jump with register containing the address. So, we use this as a means to jump to an arbitrary location and also as a mechanism to carry out multiway branch. Uh, as we went along we also felt the need of some pseudo instructions and some of the pseudo instructions we have defined are shown here. Move is something which is very frequently used simply moving a data from one register to other register essentially a copy of values made. Load address, uh, load immediate which loads a constant into a register and uh, some variations of branch. Okay. These uh, instructions are implemented by one or more real instructions. Okay. Some of these we have seen how they get expanded, some of these we will discuss in tutorials. So, uh, today we will uh, talk about uh, what actually is involved in uh, procedural abstraction. To implement a procedure what all we require, <coughs> what activities or what functions the instruction have to support. Uh, we will illustrate all this with an example. I will take, I will continue with that sorting example which we had built up in the last class and try to do in the form of functions there. And uh, finally, we will find that uh, there are registers which are although general purpose, but certain conventions have to be followed in order to develop a program smoothly. Okay, so, what actually we mean by a procedural abstraction? So essentially procedural abstraction means that uh, there is a piece of code which you can write once and use it uh, one or more times thinking of that as a single statement. Okay, so, it could be an arbitrary piece of uh, code which does a computation which has a well defined well identified meaning and uh, this, this becomes your basic operation either a single operation or a single statement uh, which can be used with the same ease and convenience as you do. Uh, for the basic operations. So, here it shows for example, that uh, there is a main program, there are two procedures P and Q and uh, P is being called here, this computation is performed, then there is a return which is made. There is another point here, where Q is being called and then there is a return. Similarly, P and Q are being called again and uh, there is a return. So, uh, the number of time we use could be arbitrary and uh, to implement this we require several things. Okay, Several things have to be kept in mind. First of all, there is a control linkage. You have to worry about flow of control. That means, uh, from main program you should be able to call that means, transfer the control Okay, in such a manner that uh, when the procedure ends the control returns back to the point where you made a call. Okay. So, so this there is a linkage which is required, <coughs> it is not simply a matter of uh, using a jump statement uh, one way and the jump statement other way. You need to know where you came from, so that return can be appropriately made, because call may occur from several different points and uh, return has to be made accordingly. So, so that is a key part here. Secondly, uh, every time you invoke a procedure, it may work on different set of data. So, there is a concept of parameters of procedure and uh, when procedure is called some data flows into the procedure, okay, parameters are passed and when computation is over results flow back to the calling program. Okay, so, the, the parameters which carry value into it and those which carry value back to the caller. Apart from uh, the, the parameters which are uh, decided by the caller or the result which are consumed by the caller. There are also often uh, local storage declarations which you may have inside a procedure a function. Okay. 
and uh, if you if you call a function multiple times then uh, it's uh, considered to be a fresh allocation of storage okay so how do we handle that uh, at the same time uh, a procedure may make an access to the data which is defined outside so they could be global data they could be local <coughs> data and that both need to be accessible uh, in uh, what i depict, depicted in the previous picture was a very simple case where a main program and there is a function or procedure which is called but they could be nesting uh, in in the previous case p could have called q okay q could be called by the main q could also be called by p and uh, matter gets complicated further if there is a recursion there could be a direct recursion or indirect recursion that means p could have called itself or p calls q and q calls p okay so uh, there could be direct or indirect recursion and uh, all this all these issues of control flow data flow organizing local and global storage become more complex when you have to take into account the need for nesting and need for recursion so uh, <coughs> let's take the first thing first uh, how do you organize the flow of control i am taking here the same example of uh, a very simple minded sorting program okay where we simply had double loop and uh, the main operation in, inside the loop was uh, inter comparison and interchange so that comparison and interchange uh, we <coughs> suppose we define as a function or a procedure okay which i am calling as xchg exchange and uh, now it is basically this exchange with some other overhead which is uh enveloped in two nested loops okay now uh, what what happens at the assembly level uh, the rest of it is same okay the only change is here uh <coughs> earlier what i had done here was that uh, although i had not shown in the same uh, same screen but uh, this comparison and exchange was basically a set of instructions some seven eight instructions which were uh, placed here okay now we don't place the instructions here we put uh, a call instruction or uh, which is called jal jump and link jal stand for jump and link and uh, i am treating xchg as a label okay so somewhere there is an instruction with uh, this xchg as a label attached and the effect of uh, jal instruction is to uh, transfer the call transfer the control much in the same way as uh, jump instruction does but it does one more additional thing it uh, saves the current address of <coughs> instruction into a special register uh, well it is special in terms of functionality but it's one of those 32 registers which we uh, symbolically denote by ra which stands for return address so the effect of this is that dollar uh, ra or the return address register gets the value of pc plus 4 so uh, if pc is pertaining to this instruction uh, ra will now contain address of the instruction which is following this is the point where you have to return after completing the procedure okay so this address would be ready in uh, uh, ra register and when you are done with the procedure you can use that address and link back so rest of it i have not changed and uh, here you can see how call actually has been established okay now let's see what happens at the other end so that uh, what i called as the main step earlier uh, i have encapsulated in the form of a function <coughs> okay so uh, uh, we are not returning any value so i have return value is void there is no parameter being passed uh, it's simply looking at global values and doing something with it <coughs> all right so uh, i've just added a return statement here and in terms of uh, mix language uh, this is the same piece of code okay i have uh, put this as a label and at the end i say jr dollar ra okay it is the same jr instruction which takes contents of a register and uses that as the destination or target address so since uh, jl had stored return address in this register you can simply do jr and get back so so these are the two instructions which actually provide control flow and linkage of uh, caller and the callee
Okay. Now uh, let's look at the question of passing parameters. Okay, we have seen how control is linked. Now we see how to take care of data. Now uh, in this case, what I've done is uh, from the previous picture, the only change is that I'm making P and R as arguments or the parameters. Okay, so the the function need not look at uh, values which were with the main, but it is explicitly passed on <coughs> P and R, the two pointers, right? Uh, now, what the way it is done, the simplest method is what is shown here, is uh, use some specific registers which are designated for passing parameters. So, the, the values which have to go into the procedure are loaded into these specific registers. So, in this case, uh, you can see dollar a 0 and dollar <coughs> a 1. These are the two registers which are part of the set of registers from where I can convey the parameters. So, uh, all I have done is I have uh, changed the register which I was using there. Okay, I was using something arbitrarily, but now I am just making sure that uh, p is passed in a 0 and r is passed in a 1 and the uh, rest of it, rest of the program has been accordingly modified. Okay. So, uh, no extra statement, it is just that I am careful about which registers I have to use for this purpose and uh, typically I will avoid using them for something else. So, uh, what happens uh, if you have large number of parameters? The convention is that if you have up to four parameters, there are four registers designated for it which are labeled as a 0, a 1, a 2 and a 3 okay. and actually that will cover lots of common cases. Similarly, the values being returned or the output from the procedure or function is through two registers v 0 and v 1. So, once again this would suffice for many common cases. Uh, what happens when the number of values going in or coming out is more than 4 and 2 respectively? In such a case, uh, we have to resort to memory. So, any additional parameters which you have, you can place them in specific memory locations and the, the function is expected to uh, load them from there, work with them and the results can be partly returned through registers. If there are more, they can be returned through memory locations. So, so that that is a simple extension of uh, what we have seen through registers. Okay, uh, the, the next issue was <coughs> that of uh, defining local storage. Suppose within the procedure, within the function, there is an array declaration or there are structures which are defined. So, what do you do? Uh, you can organize each of the function or procedures with its own storage area with that is the data area and the area where its code is kept. So, for example, uh, if you look at this picture, this is <coughs> this is the main, okay. Uh, this is green one is the data area, this is the code area. Then there is P, green is the data area, code area for Q data and code. Okay, so I have just placed them one after another in contiguous location. Uh, it is not necessary that data has to be before code. Uh, any convention you can follow. Uh, all that I am trying to say here is that uh, each of the functions or procedure has its data and code together. Okay. Another alternative could be that you have an overall data area where you keep data of each function or procedure and then there is overall code area where you have uh, code part of each function or procedure. So, any, any of the convention can be followed and of course, uh, a compiler uh, would follow always a specific convention and produce the code accordingly. So, it has to, it will process all the procedures, uh, they look at their code part, look at their data part and uh, uh, do storage assignment accordingly. Now, let us uh, move to the case of nested calls. That means, 
uh, a function can call another function. So, I am showing here an example where uh, this is the main. Okay. At some point, you are calling function p. Okay. This is p and uh, there is some computation here, somewhere you are calling q and this is q. So, this is the return point of q, this is the return point of p. How will they appear in assembly? Uh, you have j l p for this call. Uh, so, that will bring the control here and at some point you say j l q, the control gets transferred <coughs> here. Okay. Here you expect that uh, j r dollar r a brings you back here, go further, you expect that j r dollar r a brings you back here. Okay. So, that is how you want control to be linked, but uh, now what will happen? Uh, when first call occurs, the address of the instruction here, which is after this j l gets stored in r a. Okay. But when you reach this point and uh, issue another JAL instruction, then uh, the old address which was there in R A gets replaced by address of the instruction following this. Okay, so there is no way you can return to the main. And uh, here this call will occur correctly, this return will occur correctly. But uh, after this point, again when you say return, the program will get back to this point. So it will, it might uh, get into an endless loop here. Uh, and the solution is uh, very simple that is you must take the precaution that the return address which was made available here should be saved somewhere and before you do j r it should be restored. Okay. So, now this, this procedure would have uh, some local storage uh, to that you can add one more location where it preserves its return address. All right. So, now in between many calls can occur, q can call something else and so on, but as long as p takes care of where it has to return, uh, it, the, the job would be done, you will not make a mistake. So, q can take care of saving its own. So, uh, what you could do is the, the first thing when you enter a procedure, uh, you, you save the contents of r a into some memory location and just before call, the last thing you do before returning, sorry not before call just before return, the last thing you do is from that memory location uh, load into R A. <coughs> okay. So, uh, once you have done that, in between R A is free, you can make any calls, you may or may not make a call okay. and uh, there could be any nesting of calls. So, here is an example. <coughs> Uh, what, what I have done is that in that uh, sorting case, sorting problem, uh, the inner loop has been redefined as another function. Okay, you recall that it was trying to find a minimum and put it at the right place, okay, minimum of certain number of elements. So, it was uh, being passed as uh, Uh, it is being passed as two parameters <coughs> p where which is the pointer to place where minimum value has to be kept and r is a pointer to the area in array from where you need to start scanning. So, <coughs> r is uh, made p plus 1 and then you make a call. Okay. So, we what min will do is it will uh, go through that loop, go, go through a scan of the array from r onwards and bring the minimum element back to uh, location pointed by p. So, rest is same and now we are left with a single loop here. So, there is a single loop called to min, uh, min has that uh, inner loop basically, okay. it performs that exchange condition, conditional exchange, compare and exchange, <coughs> update r and keep repeating. Okay. Uh, so, <coughs> this is as it is, this I have not changed, this is the innermost activity which you do compare and interchange. Let us see now how these will be done each of these. So, the main body, uh, 
we have simply uh, jal to min okay as a replacement for this and we are making sure that the two parameter okay there is a mistake here there are two parameters p and r so i am making sure that uh, the two <coughs> parameters are in a0 and a1 so that uh, uh, both caller and the callee understand uh, where the values are to be uh, looked look, looked at and uh, this is the call to min procedure this is uh, the same min procedure and this is how we have implementation so i have added these two instructions here right uh, apart from that it's a simple loop this is the same loop makes a call to exchange uh, updates r compares and goes back so this is a simple loop here uh, and that basically forms the body of this function all i have done is i have actually uh, padded up with save and load here so here i am saving r a value into this location and i am loading it into this location so uh, now please notice here that i have i have used this load and store somewhat like a pseudo instruction okay i am not uh, worrying about whether this uh, address called ra save is is a small constant or large constant or how it is to be handled so i am just leaving it as it is uh, assembler will translate this into uh, uh, possibly two instructions okay or two or more instructions uh, which will prepare the address into a register and then with the suitable offset it will uh, use sw lw instruction so again elaboration of this we will see separately uh, but all that we need to uh, understand here is that ra is getting saved somewhere and from the same location ra is being restored okay now let's move a step further okay and go for what is called recursive call which means a procedure directly or indirectly <coughs> called itself so there is a cycle which is formed and we have uh, b basically changed this loop which was inside min into recursive calls okay so so uh, it does not it's not necessarily just it's not necessarily improving the program but just uh, for illustration i have rewritten as a uh, recursive call here so if r is less than equal to q instead of saying jump to exchange okay i am saying make a call to this function and meanwhile uh, the value of parameter has changed r has changed so you will keep on calling this uh, and return when you find that this is false okay when r exceeds uh, final value then you start return and uh, r is unchanged so you you will uh, keep on returning keep on finding this false and uh, all chain of returns will happen okay so so is it are you able to follow this program right now uh, let us see its uh, translation in mips so i i i took care of saving this and restoring this right uh, earlier i was making this comparison and looping back so instead of looping back uh, i am making a call to min again okay now the parameters i am uh, maintaining in a0 and a1 so i i don't need to do anything else i simply make a call and i am hoping that uh, the control will repeatedly enter this and appropriately exit uh, now what will happen if i do this where do you see the problem yes i am uh, every time i am saving ra value into same fixed memory location right so uh, first time the value which gets stored is the value corresponding to call which came from outside subsequent calls are getting generated inside so subsequent returns are to this point you see here there is a call and uh, the return takes place here okay so these uh, the the 
every time now return will take place here because uh, the original entry point from outside has been lost. So, the, the solution of this is that I should uh, not lose any value which is saved and in natural structure, <coughs> natural data structure where the value can be saved or is a stack which is the last in first out structure. Because the order in which calls occur and the order in which returns take place are in a last in first out uh, manner and therefore, uh, as I enter into function from wherever call is occurring, the return address gets pushed in a stack okay. and just before returning, I pop the latest one from the stack and use it for JR instruction. Okay. So, irrespective of uh, how calls are occurring, whether it is uh, uh, nesting of calls to different procedures or there is a recursion to same procedure directly or indirectly, you can simply keep on pushing the return addresses uh, into a stack. As soon as you enter a function, push the return address into stack and just before exiting, take it off from the stack and return. So, now the question is how do you do this? Uh, there, there are no direct instructions in MIPS available uh, for pushing and popping. Uh, the, the stack is created basically by using a special register called uh, stack pointer. So, once again it is one of the 32 registers which is used to implement a stack. So, pictorially let us say this is a stack uh, and uh, conceptually you can make stack grow towards uh, reducing addresses or increasing addresses. So, I am imagining that uh, let us say address 0 of memory is at the top and maximum address is at the bottom. So, so somewhere I define bottom of the stack and <coughs> start building stack towards lower addresses towards 0. And uh, this register SP will always point to top of the stack. So, for push what I need is that uh, decrement the stack pointer to create space for uh, putting in data and then uh, store the value you want to put in the stack. So, add immediate sp sp minus 4, uh, then store word ra at sp. Now, uh, one more thing I like to notice, this is just a side observation here, is that with add immediate also the constants can be positive or negative. Okay? And actually it is because of this reason there is all probably I had listed subtract immediate as an instruction, but actually there is no subtract immediate instruction. Uh, you <coughs> add immediate with a negative constant is nothing but subtraction. Okay. So, here you are subtracting 4 from stack pointer and uh, pop is just the opposite. So, you pick up value from the stack as uh, pointed by the stack pointer, put it in the uh, desired register and uh, update the stack pointer, increase it by 4 so that the value is no longer considered to be as part of the stack. So, uh, these are the instructions which you would use to save and restore the values of return address. Okay. So, this has taken care of uh, the control flow in a uh, recursive environment. Well, like we, we are ensuring that uh, information about return does not get lost. Uh, what about data? So, when you are passing parameters in a in a recursive call, uh, in, in the previous example situation was simple that uh, after the call, when I return back, I do not need those values. Okay. So, so, basically uh, every time you call is made, uh, the, the fresh values are passed on and what happened to old value, I do not have to worry about. But you could have a situation where there is some code after recursive call also. Okay. So, you, you, pass, you passed on values P and R, but you are still working with them, you need to do more operations. So, in, in that case, you cannot afford to lose old values and uh, uh, the right solution again is use a stack. So, the, the parameters could be uh, uh, passed through registers 
uh, if situation is simple, but uh, if you if you need parameters to be uh, available even after the nested calls old parameters, you need to keep them in the stack. So, you can save the parameters or you can pass the parameters through stack. Okay. Uh, uh, also recall that I mentioned that if number of parameters more than 4, you use memory locations. So, now uh, that question also gets answered which memory locations. So, uh, additional parameter you can simply push in the stack. Okay. So, before you call, you load the parameter in the stack and uh, when you are inside the function, you can take it off the stack. Uh, stack is also used for allocating the local data. So, now imagine that you have a recursive call to a function which has its own local data. So, it means for every occurrence, for every instance of uh, the, the function, uh, a new array has to be declared. Suppose there is a local array. So, uh, with every call a new array has to be declared and they cannot be all located at a fixed address. <coughs> Once again the natural place for them is stack. So, uh, over on the top of the stack when you enter a function, you can create you can earmark space which corresponds to your local data. So, you can create your local arrays or all local structures uh, at the top of the stack and uh, before you exit, you can clean up that area. Okay. So, it is no longer required. Okay. Uh, one more problem one has to pay attention to when talking of uh, uh, procedure is uh, that when you are writing a program, you assume availability of certain number of registers and you, you may freely use them, uh, but when a call occurs, the control is getting transferred to uh, a function, okay, which will again require registers for its own computation. And uh, the, when control comes back to the main, the, the main program will continue with the computation which was done partially. So, some intermediate results may be available in the registers. And uh, if you are not careful, you may conflict. Imagine a situation that uh, main program is written by one person, one programmer, and uh, the function is written by another programmer. So, uh, either they write in sequence once uh, A finishes, tells that I have used these registers, you go and use the other registers, or uh, th there could be a fixed division. All right. So, th there is a there is a convention which can be followed which is the task and if if necessary you save the registers. So, if, if uh, let us say you are writing the calling program, uh, you have done partial computation, some results are in the register, you, you need to make a call and then come back and continue. So, the, the values you, which you need to preserve, you have to take care that you save them. Okay. So, uh, whether caller should save or callee should save. Again, uh, a convention uh, helps in this area, and this question, uh, con this conflict will not be there. Otherwise, uh, you would write programs. Two people will write program. There will be a conflict. Uh, one would destroy the value of others, and then fingers will point to each other. So the convention which is followed here in MIPS is uh, given here that registers S0, S1, S2, etc. These are called saved temporary registers. Okay. Uh, it, uh, the caller can assume that it is safe to leave values in these registers and uh, uh, everyone has to ensure that values of these is preserved across calls. So, if some partial results were left in S registers, uh, you can be safe if everyone is working, uh, if everyone is comp complying with the convention, then you can assume that values will be retained. And uh, if callee uh, feels the necessity of using registers, it will be made in a very transparent manner. So, it will save the values before using, save the caller's value which were left in these registers before using, uh, make, a, make use and then restore those values. So, as far as caller is concerned, caller will stick to that assumption that uh, value in these is not disturbed. If it is disturbed, it is done in a manner that you do not come to know of. Similarly, registers T0 to T9 are called simply temporary registers, where uh, values are not expected to be preserved. So, 
poly has no responsibility of leaving these untempered okay and uh, on the other hand if collar requires these values to be saved okay if uh, it needs more values than these 8 to be saved across calls it can put in these uh, but then there is no guarantee so uh, if there were values in this uh, caller is expected to save them somewhere safely then make a call and uh, when you come back uh, recover that recover these values so these are not preserved across call and they are saved by caller <laughs> if necessary right so th th these are the these conventions uh, define who has what responsibility okay in terms of uh, uh, tempering with the values or touching the values and saving in case if it is required so now all put together we have been talking of lots of register names and uh, th there is some convention uh, in some cases there is hardware constraint uh, so here is a summary of all the registers uh, which we have talked about so starting with 0 okay this is uh, ensured by hardware that the value is constant 0 in this uh, okay this is uh, one thing is missed out here dollar 80 is register number 1 okay it was assembler temporary which is used for uh, expanding pseudo instructions so when <coughs> expanding pseudo instruction requires a temporary calculation uh, for example preparation of address or storing the comparison result then assembler uses dollar 80 okay or register 1 and uh, programmer is expected not to use that because if you use it and at the same time you are also using uh, some pseudo instruction you can uh, run into problem then the next few are for uh, parameter passing v0 v1 are basically number 2 and 3 uh, they are used for returning values a0 to a3 are passing values into the param into the procedures so they are numbered 4 to 7 then we have t0 to t7 these are temporaries s0 to s7 are uh, saved temporaries uh, for some reason t8 t9 are uh, not contiguous with these um, then then there is a gap there are some registers which are used by kernel again they are reserved uh, then we have global pointer <coughs> so if you have uh, global data okay uh, which is shared by many functions many procedures then uh, that could be in some contiguous area uh, and a register gp could be made to point to that and uh, with suitable offset to that register you can access various components of the data sp is the stack pointer which i talked of uh, ra is the return address and fp is frame pointer i uh, will describe its use uh, shortly so uh, these are the names which you can conveniently use internally they are uh, dollar 0 dollar 2 dollar 4 etc and that is the <coughs> usage uh, so hardware wise uh, it is ensured that register 0 has certain value and uh, jal instruction uh, assumes that value is to be put in ra okay others are by convention Okay, so so the fact that we are using these for parameter passing is only a matter of convention the hardware does not know this similarly that uh, the convention about these about t's and s is again uh, a convention and hardware does not understand this stack pointer is again a convention that we are using this particular register for pointer to stack anyone can be used okay once again it is a convention uh, with RA there is a role of the hardware in the sense that when you execute JAL instruction the return address is put in this particular register okay the, the return instruction the JR is a general instruction it is not specifically for return we have seen other usages of it okay finally I like to show you uh, what is called an activation record or a frame uh, we have uh, 
talked about putting so many things in the stack. Okay, once once you come to recursive calls, then basically everything, uh, the solution for everything I mentioned was stack. So all this information in the stack is organized in a in a particular manner, uh, which is again a convention, and uh, different systems may follow different convention. So what is typically followed is shown here. So every time a function or procedure is called. Uh, you create an activation record on top of the stack okay and when you when you return you clear that off so as the nested calls occur you you build these uh, activation records in the stack uh, or these frames in the stack and uh, typically the stack pointer will point to top of the activation record and other pointer which i mentioned other register fp is called frame pointer points to the beginning Okay, it could point to the first location here or maybe the last location of previous activation record. Again, convention could slightly vary. So, I have tried to put almost everything which I discussed earlier. The arguments which are being passed on would be one part of this record. The return address which is to be saved is saved here. Uh, any S registers which you need to save, they get saved here. Local data is allocated here. So uh, this whole thing is the is the frame. So uh, a function basically works with this. Okay, this is what it sees as as local in, uh, local data area. And uh, apart from this, it may make reference to some global data. So it will use uh, that will be accessible through GP pointer. So through GP, FP, and SP uh, access is made to all the data within a function. <coughs> now the, the question would be why we are having two pointers SP and FP. Uh, so, so one might imagine that suppose you have a pointer either here or to the either to the bottom or to the top everything could be referenced uh, in terms of some suitable offset from this point or that point. <coughs> okay, but there is a difficulty in that uh, particularly when the size of this changes dynamically. Okay. Uh, if within the function you are doing any dynamic storage allocation, okay, we, we have not seen at assembly level how you do that, but, but uh, suppose the, the program is sophisticated and uh, dynamically allocation gets done, so this moves up. So now uh, this can no longer act as a reference point for accessing the data because uh, we, we want the offset to be constant. Okay. Typically, the way you like to access is uh, uh, load word, some constant offset and uh, maybe uh, register in the bracket is SP. So, with respect to this pointer, the offsets are for these are constants, okay. but with respect to this pointer offsets may not be constant. Uh, we, we need uh, a pointer to this top to keep track of how far the stack is filled up, so, so that is required in any case. But uh, another pointer here, uh, so that all these can be accessed with a constant offset is required. Okay, so let us uh, summarize, let us close at this point. Uh, we have seen uh, some of the basic ideas of how we create procedural abstraction in uh, assembly language. Uh, first issue was that of arranging procedure call and return. Then we saw how parameters are passed. We talked of uh, the complications which arise because of nesting of calls and also recursion. Uh, the, the solution was to follow a lot of conventions and also uh, to use stack uh, for all storage allocation. Uh, so, so, so with that we have seen uh, the basic idea. Uh, I, I would in the next class I will take an illustration and uh, show how a, a complex recursive procedure can be uh, programmed where you, you need to do uh, activation record creation. Okay, I will stop at that. If you have any questions, I would answer those. Can you explain frame pointer again? Okay. Yeah, uh, frame pointer. Uh, the basic idea here is that we have all the data allocated on the stack. Okay. 
uh, if if the data was uh, of a size which is fixed when you are writing the program, then every every piece of data can be accessed with a constant offset with respect to top of the stack. Okay, uh, but if situation is different, that means uh, let us say there is some data structure. Maybe you have uh, prepared a, there is a local linked list, for example, where the size may grow or shrink as the as the function proceeds. So uh, all that allocation of the linked records will be on top of the stack, and therefore the the top of the stack will keep changing. So stack pointer can no longer be used. Uh, with constant offsets to access, for example, these arguments or the return value or these registers. So, uh, we have a pointer to the bottom and with respect to that, the offsets of uh, all this part is constant. All right. Of course, the, the access to the dynamic part uh, will be changing and uh, it will not be accessed in the same manner. For that, we would need more complex methods, but at least the part which is <coughs> unchanged whose uh, location or seat is unchanged during the life of the function, we can simply access by uh, a constant offset to the frame pointer. Okay, there was some question over there. Yeah. Since that, uh, it wasn't happening that we are pushing all the addresses and uh, pop is happening only once. Uh, yes, actually, uh, in aggregate terms, the pushes and pops have to match. Okay, so you 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 might push different things uh, in in pieces. For example, you may push arguments, then may you may push return address, then you push registers. So sev several instruction may be used and stack pointer may be made to grow in many steps. Uh, uh, now, when you need these things, you, you can you can use them and you may clear off uh, activation record in one go or again you may do it in parts. Uh, all you have to ensure is that uh, the space which was allocated should be equal to the space which gets deallocated eventually. Okay. So, so these have to be matched. In fact, uh, this could be one very, very common source of error if your uh, pushes and pops do not match, there could be serious problem in the program. Uh, how much memory is allocated to the stack pointer? Okay, uh, the memory allocated to the stack pointer, uh, stack, stack pointer is just uh, one register. Okay, so, your question should be, how much memory is allocated for the stack? Uh, there is no often no fixed memory may be allocated. You you, you may start uh, at uh, let's say one end of the memory and allow this to grow in one direction. Okay, sometime uh, you have okay. Let me. Okay, uh, often you may have in your entire memory, you may have uh, this is a very typical case that you have two areas, two data areas which grow in opposite direction. 
okay one is called heap other is called uh, stack so uh, for example if this is stack it grows in this direction grows and shrinks other could be heap which grows and shrinks so heap would be used for uh, random allocations for uh, malloc and so on and uh, this stack is used for automatic allocations when calls and returns happen and uh, uh, you you could actually what you could do is you may make a fixed partition and say that above this is the area for heap below this area for stack but uh, th that that may constraint sometimes you need more stack area less heap area sometimes you need more heap area less stack area so uh, a common policy is to uh, not have this line okay and uh, let them grow freely so that total space is available as long as they don't uh, clash into each other uh, your program works successfully so if if it if it does then you run out of memory okay so i hope i have answered this question of how much space you allocate so you you may often not allocate a fixed space and leave it to grow or shrink dynamically okay thank you